All right. Hello and welcome to Storytime with Alaric. Um, I do appear to be having some microphone problems, unexpectedly. It's reading a lot quieter than it normally does, but hopefully it is all right. So we are once again reading Hyperion by Dan Simmons. And we are continuing the poet's tale. Notes for a sketch on of life in the hegemony. My home has 38 rooms on 36 worlds. No doors. The arched entrances are farcaster portals, a few opaque with privacy curtains, most open to observation and entry. Each room has windows everywhere and at least two walls with portals. From the grand dining hall on a Renaissance vector, I can see the bronze skies and the verdigris towers of Keep and Abel in the valley below my volcanic peak, and by turning my head I can look through the Farcaster portal and across the expanse of white carpet in the formal living area to see Edgar Allan Sea crashing against the spires of Point Prospero on Nevermore. My library looks out on the glaciers and green skies of Nordholm, while a walk of ten paces allows me to descend a short stairway to my tower study, a comfortable open room encircled by polarized glass, which, offer, which offers a 360-degree view of the highest peaks of the Kushput Kerak Rome, a mountain range 2,000 kilometers from the nearest settlement in the easternmost reaches of the Jamnu Republic, a Danube Dre. The huge sleeping room Helendia and I share rocks gently in the boughs of a 300-meter world tree on the Templar world of God's Grove, and connects to Solarium, which sits alone on the arid salt flats of Hebron. Not all of our views are of wilderness. The media room opens to a skimmer pad on the 138th floor of a Tau City Center arc tower, and our patio lies on a terrace overlooking the market and the old section of bustling New Jerusalem. The architect, the student of the legendary Million de Havre, has incorporated several small jokes into the house's design. The steps go down to the tower room, of course, but equally droll is the exit from the ire, which leads to the exercise room on the lowest level of Lucius's deepest hive. Or perhaps the guest bedroom, which consists, consists of toilet, bidet, sink, and shower stall on an open, wallless raft, afloat on the violet seas of Mare Infinitus. At first, the shifts in gravity from room to room were disturbing, but I soon adapted, subconsciously bracing myself for the drag of Lucius and Hebron and Sol Draconi Septurn, unconsciously anticipating the less than one standard G freedom of the majority of the rooms. In the ten standard months Helenda and I are together, we spend little time in our home, preferring instead to move with friends among the resorts and vacation archaeologies and night spots of the world web. Our friends are the former Farcaster set, now calling themselves the Caribou Herd after an extinct Old Earth migratory mammal. This herd consists of other writers, a few successful visual artists, concourse intellectuals, all thing media representatives, a few radical arnists, and cosmetic gene splicers, web aristocrats, wealthy Farcaster freaks, and flashback addicts, a few Holly and stage directors, a scattering of actors and performance artists, several mafia. Dawn's gone straight, and a revolting list of recent celebrities, myself included. Everyone drinks, uses stims and auto implants, takes the wire, and can afford the best drugs. The drug of choice is flashback. It is definitely an upper-class class vice. One needs the full range of expensive implants to fully experience it. Helenda had seen to it that I have been so fitted. Biomonitors, sensory extenders, and internal comm log, neural shunts, kickers, metacortex processors, blood chips, RNA tapeworms. My mother wouldn't have recognized my insides. I try flashback twice. The first time is a glide. I target my ninth birthday party and hit it with the first salvo. It is all there. The servants singing on the north lawn at daybreak. Don Balthazar grudgingly canceling classes so I can spend the day with Elmalfa in my, in my EMV streaking across the gray dunes of the Amazon Basin in gay abandon. The torchlight procession that evening, as representatives of the other old families arrive at dusk, their brightly wrapped presents gleaming under the moon and the ten thousand lights. I rise from nine hours and flash back with a smile on my face. The second trip almost kills me. I'm four and crying, seeking my mother through endless rooms smelling of dust and old furniture. Android servants seek to console me, but I shake off their hands, running down the hallway soiled with shadows and the soot of too many generations. 
breaking the first rule I ever learned. I throw open the doors to Mother's sewing room, her sanctum sanctorium to which she retires for three hours every afternoon, and from which she emerges with her soft smile, the hem of her pale dress whispering across the carpet like the echoes of a ghost's sigh. Mother is sitting there in the shadows. I'm four, and my finger has been hurt, and I rush to her, throwing myself into her arms. She does not respond. One of her elegant arms remains reclined along the back of the chaise lounge. The other remains limp on the cushion. I pull back, shocked by her cool plasticity. I tug open the heavy velvet drapes without rising from her lap. Mother's eyes are white, rolled back in her head. Her lips are slightly open. Drool moistens the corners of her mouth and glints on her perfect chin. From the gold threads of her hair, done up in the grand dame style she favors, I see the cold steel gleam of the stim wire and the duller sheen of the skull socket she has plugged it into. The patch of bone on either side is very white. On the table near her left hand lies the empty flashback syringe. The servants arrive and pull me away. Mother never blinks. I am pulled, screaming from the room. I wake, screaming. Perhaps it was my refusal to use flashback again which hastened Helena's departure, but I doubt it. I was a toy to her, a primitive who amused her by my innocence about life she had taken for granted for many decades. Whatever the case, my refusal to flashback left me with many days without her. The time spent in replay is real time, and flashback users often die having spent more days of their lives under the drug than they ever experienced conscious. At first, I entertained myself with implants and the techno toys, which had, been, which had been denied to me as a member of an old Earth family. The datasphere was a construct delight that first year. I called up information almost constantly, living in a frenzy of full interface. I was as addicted to raw data as the caribou herd were to their stims and drugs. I can imagine Don Balthazar spinning in his, in his molten grave as I gave up long-term memory for the transient satisfaction of implant omniscience. It was only later that I felt the loss. Fitzgerald's Odyssey, Wu's Final March, the score and a score of other epics which had survived my stroke now were shredded like cloud fragments in a high wind. Much later, freed of implants, I painstakingly learned them all again. For the first and only time in my life, I became political. Days and nights would pass with me monitoring the Senate on Farcaster Cable or lying tapped into the All Thing. Someone once estimated that the All Thing deals with about a hundred active pieces of hegemony legislation per, per day, and during my months spent screwed into the sensorium, I missed none of them. My voice and name became well known on the debate channels. No bill was too small, no issue too simple or too complex for my input. The simple act of voting every few minutes gave me a false sense of having accomplished something. I finally gave up the political obsession only after I realized that accessing the all thing regularly meant either staying home or turning into a walking zombie. A person constantly busy accessing on his implants makes a pitiful sight in public, and it didn't take Kalinda's derision to make me realize that if I stayed home, I would turn into an all thing sponge like so many millions of other slugs around the web. So I gave up politics. But by then I had found a new passion, religion. I joined religions. Hell, I helped create religions. The Zen Gonastic Church was expanding exponentially, and I became a true believer, appearing in HTV talk shows and searching for my place of, places of power with all of the, the, the devoutness of pre hedra Muslim pilgrimaging to Mecca. Besides, I loved fair casting. I had earned almost a hundred million marks from royalties for the dying earth, and Helinda had invested well. But someone once figured that a Farcaster home such as mine cost more than 50,000 marks a day just to keep in the web, and I did not limit my Farcasting to the 36 worlds of my home. Transline Publishing had qualified me for a gold universal card, and I used it liberally, Farcasting to unlikely corners of the web, and then spending weeks staying in luxury accommodations and leasing EMVs to find my places of power in remote areas of backwater worlds. I found none. I renounced Zen Gnasticism with about the same time Helena divorced me. By the time the bills were piling up and I had to liquidate most of the stocks and long-term investments remaining to me after Helena had taken her share, I was not only naive and in, and in love when she had her attorney drop the marriage contract, I was stupid. Eventually, even with such economies as cutting down my forecasting and dismissing the android servants, I was facing, facing financial disaster. I went to see Tyrena Wengreen Faith. 
No one wants to read poetry, she said, leafing through the thin stack of cantos I had written in the past year and a half. What do you mean? I said. The dying earth was poetry. The dying earth was a fluke, said Tyrina. Her nails were long and green and curved in the latest Mandarin fashion. They curled around my manuscript like the claws of some chlorophyll beast. It sold because the mass subconscious was ready for it. Maybe the mass subconscious is ready for this, I said. I was beginning to get angry. Tyrina laughed. It was not an altogether pleasant sound. Martin, 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 she said, this is poetry. You're writing about Heaven's Gate and the caribou herd, but what comes across is loneliness, displacement, angst, and a cynical look at humanity. So? So no one wants to pay for a look at another person's angst, laughed Tyrina. I turned away from her desk and walked to the far side of the room. Her office took up the entire 435th floor of the trans line spire in the Babel section of Tau City Center. There were no windows. The circular room was open from floor to ceiling, shielded by a solar-generated containment field, which showed no shimmer whatsoever. It was like standing between two gray plates suspended halfway between the sky and earth. I watched Crimson's clouds move between the lesser spires half a kilo kilometer below, and I thought about hubris. Tyrena's office had no doorways, stairways, elevators, field lifts, or trap doors. No connection to the other levels at all. One entered Tyrena's office through the five-fauceted farcaster, which shimmered in midair like an abstract hollow sculpture. I found myself thinking about tower fires and power failures, as well as hubris. I said, Are you saying that you won't publish it? Not at all, smiled my editor. You've earned Transline several billion marks, Martin. We will publish it. All I'm saying is that no one will buy it. You're wrong. I shouted. No, everyone recognizes fine poetry, but there are still enough people who read it to make it a bestseller. Tyrena did not laugh again, but her smile slashed upward in a twist of green lips. Martin, 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 she said. The population of literate people has been declining steadily since Gunberg's day. By the 20th century, less than 2% of the people in the so-called industrialized democracies read even one book a year. And that was before the smart machines, data spheres, and user-friendly environments. By the Hegra, 98% of the hegemony's populations had no reason to read anything, so they don't bother learning how to. It's worse today. There are more than 100 billion human beings in the world web, and less than 1% of them bothers to hard facts any printed material, much less read a book. The Dying Earth sold almost 3 billion copies, I reminded her. Mm-hmm, said T Tyrena. It was the Pilgrim's Progress Effect. The what? Pilgrim's Progress Effect. In the Massachusetts colony of, um, what was it? 17th century Old Earth. Every decent family had to have a copy in the household. But, my heavens, no one had to read it. It was the same with Hitler's Mein Kampf or Stutsky's visions in the eye of a decapitated child. Who was Hitler, I said. Tyrena smiled slightly. An Old Earth politician who did some writing. Mein Kampf is still in print. Transline renews the copyright every 138 years. Well, look, I said. I'm going to take a few weeks to polish up the cantos and give it my best shot. Fine, smiled Tyrena. I suppose you want to edit edit it the way you did last time? Not at all, said Tyrena. Since there's no core of nostalgia this time, you might as well write it in the way that you want it. I blinked. You mean I can keep in the blank verse this time? Of course. And the philosophy? Please do. And the experimental sections? Yes. And you'll print it the way I write it? Absolutely. Is there a chance it'll sell? Not a hope in hell. My few weeks to polish up the cantos turned into ten months of obsessive labor. I shut off most of the rooms in the house, keeping only the tower room on Demubdri, the exercise room on Lucius, the kitchen, and the bathroom raft on Mare and Finitus. I worked a straight ten hours a day, took a break for some vigorous exercise, followed by a meal and a nap, and then returned to my writing table for another eight-hour stint. It was similar to the, t to the time five years before when I was recovering from my stroke, and it sometimes took an hour or a day for a word to come to me, for a concept to sink its roots into the firm soil of language. Now it was even slower process as I agonized over the perfect word, the precise rhyme scheme, the most playful image, the most ineffable analog to the most elusive emotion. After ten standards months, I was done acknowledging the ancient aphorism to the effect that no book or poem is ever finished, merely abandoned. What do you think? I asked Tyrena as she read through the first copy. Her eyes were blank, 
bronze discs in that week's fashion, but this did not hide the fact that there were tears there. She brushed one away. It's beautiful, she said. I tried to rediscover the voice of some of the ancients, I said, suddenly shy. You succeeded brilliantly. The Heaven's Gate interlude is still rough, I said. It's perfect. It's about loneliness, I said. It is loneliness. You think it's ready, I asked. It's perfect. A masterpiece. Do you think it'll sell, I asked. No fucking way. They planned an initial run of 70 million hard facts copies of Cantos. Transline runs ads through the data sphere, placing HTV commercials, transmitted software inserts, successfully soliciting blurbs from best-selling offers, made sure it was viewed in the New York Times book section and the TC2 review, and generally spent a fortune on advertising. The Canto sold 23,000 hard facts copies during the first year it was in print. A 10% roll royalties of the 2012 MK cover price, I had earned back 13,800 MK of my 2 million MK advance from Transline. The second year saw a sale of 638 hard facts copies. There were no Datasphere rights sold, no Holly options, no book tours. When the Cantos lacked in sales, it made up for in negative reviews. Indecipherable, archaic, irrelevant to all current concerns, said the Times Book section. M. Silenus has committed the ultimate act of non-communication, wrote Irvin Capri in the TC2 review, by indulging himself in an orgy of pretentious obfuscation. Marmon Hamlet on All Net Now issued a final death blow. Oh, the poetry thing from What's-His-Name? Couldn't read it. Didn't try. Tyrina Wingreen Fief did not seem concerned. Two weeks after the first reviews and hard facts returns came in, and a day after my third day binge ended, I forecast her office and threw myself into the black flow form chair, which crouched in the center of the room like a velvet panther. One of Tau City Center's legendary thunderstorms was going on, and Giovanni-sized lightning crashes were rending the blood-tinged air just beyond the invisible containment field. Don't sweat it, said Tyrena. This week's fashions included a hairdo, which sent black spikes thrusting half a meter above her forehead, and a body field opacitor, which left shifting currents of color concealing and revealing the nudity beneath. The first run only amounted to 60,000 facts transmission, so we're not out much there. You said 70 million were planned, I said. Yeah, well, we changed our minds after Translize Resin AI read it. I slumped lower in the flow form. Even the AI hated it? The AI loved it, said Tyrena. That's when we knew for sure that the people were going to hate it. I sat up. Couldn't we have sold copies to the Techno Core? We did, said Tyrena. One, the millions of AIs there probably real time shared it the minute it came in over Fatline. Interstellar copyright doesn't mean shit when you're dealing with silicon. All right, I said, slumping. What next? Outside, lightning bolts the size of Old Earth's ancient superhighways dance between the corporate spires and cloud towers. Tyrena rose from her desk and walked to the edge of the carpeted circle. Her body field flickered like electricity, charged oil on water. Next, she said, you decide if you want to be a writer or the World Web's biggest jerk-off. What? You heard me. Tyrena turned and smiled. Her teeth had been capped to gold points. The contract allows us to recover the advance in any way we have to. Seizing your assets at Interbank, recovering the gold coins you've got hidden on home free, and selling that gaudy Farcaster house would about do it. And then you could jo go join the other artistic dil dilettantes and dropouts and mental cases that Sad King Billy collects on whatever outback world he lives in. I stared. Then again, she said and smiled her cannibal smile. We can just forget this temporary setback and you can get to work on your next book. My next book appeared five standard months later. The Dying Earth 2 picked up where The Dying Earth left off, in plain prose this time, the sentence length and chapter content carefully guided by neurobiomonitored response, responses on a test group of 638 average hard facts readers. The book was in novel form, short enough not to intimidate the potential buyer at Food Mart checkout stands, and the cover was a 20-second interactive hollow, wherein the tall, swarthy stranger Almifa Swartz, I suppose, though Almifa was short and pale and wore corrective lenses, rips the bodice of the struggling female just to the nipple line before the protesting blonde turns toward the viewer and cries for help 
in a breathless whisper provided by a poor and holy star, Lita Swan. Dying Earth 2 sold 19 million copies. Not, not bad, said Tyrena. It takes a while to build an audience. The first Dying Earth sold 3 billion copies, I said. Pilgrim's Progress, she said. Mein Kampf. Once in a century, maybe less. But it sold 3 billion Look, said Tyrena, in 20th century old Earth, a fast food chain took dead cow meat, fried it in grease, added carcinogens, wrapped it in a petroleum-based foam, and sold 900 billion units. Human beings. Go figure. Dying Earth 3 introduced the character of Winona, the escaped slave girl who rose to the ownership of her own fiberplastic plantation. Never mind that fiberplastic never grew on old Earth. Arturio Redgrave, the dashing blockade runner. What blockade? An innocent Sperry, the nine-year-old telepath dying of an unspecific little male disease. Innocence lasted until Dying Earth 9, and on the day Transline allowed me to kill the little shit off, I went out to celebrate with a six-day, twenty-world binge. I woke in a lung pipe on Heaven's Gate, covered with vomit and rebreather mold, nursing the web's biggest headache and the sure knowledge that I soon would have to start on Volume 10 of the Chronicles of the Dying Earth. It isn't hard being a hack writer. Between Dying Earth 2 and Dying Earth 9, six standard years had passed relatively painlessly. My research was meager, my plots formulaic, my characters cardboard, my prose preliterate, and my free time was my own. I traveled, I married twice more, each wife left, we, left me with no hard feelings, but with a sizable portion of the royalties for my next Dying Earth. I explored religions and serious drinking, finding more hope of lasting solace in the latter kept my home, adding six rooms on five worlds, and filled it with fine art. I entertained. Writers were among my acquaintances, but, as in all times, we tended to mistrust and badmouth each other, secretly resenting the other's successes and finding fault in their work. Each of us knew in his or her heart that he or she was a true artist of the word who merely happened to be commercial. The others were hacks. Then, on a cool morning, with my sleeping room rocking slightly in the upper branches of my tree on the Templar world, I awoke to a gray sky and the realization that my muse had fled. It had been five years since I had written any poetry. The cantos lay open in the Danube Dre Tower, only a few pages finished beyond what had been published. I had been using thought processors to write my novels, and one of these activated as I entered the study. Shit, it printed out. What did I do with my muse? It says something about the type of writing I had been doing that my muse could flee without me noticing. For those who did not write and who have never been stirred by the creative urge, talk of muses seems a figure of speech, a quaint conceit. For, but for those of us who live by the word, our muses are real and necessary as the soft clay of language which, help, which they help to sculpt. When one is writing, really writing, as if one is given a fat line, to the gods. No true poet has been able to explain the exhilaration one feels when the mind becomes an instrument, as surely as does the pen or the thought processor, ordering and expressing the revelations flowing in from somewhere else. My muse had fled. I sought her out in the other worlds of my house, but only silence echoed back from the art-bedecked walls and empty spaces. I far cast and flew to my favorite places, watching the sun set on the wind-blown prairies of grass and the night fogs obscure the ebony crags of Nevermore. But, although I emptied my mind of the trash, trash prose of the endless dying earth, there came no whispers from my muse. I sought her in alcohol and flashback, returning to the productive days on Heaven's Gate, when her inspiration was a constant buzzing in my ears, interrupting my work, waking me from sleep. But in the relieved hours and days, her voice was as muted and garbled as a damaged audio disc from some forgotten century. My muse had fled. I forecast to Tyrena Wingrime Fief's office at the precise moment of my appointment. Tyrena had been promoted from editor-in-chief of the Hard Facts Division to publisher. Her new office occupied the highest level of the Tau City Center Transline Spire, and standing there was like perching on the carpeted summit of the galaxy's tallest, thinnest peak. Only the invisible dome of the slightly polarized containment field arced overhead, and the edge of the carpet ended in a six-kilometer drop. 
I wondered if other authors felt the urge to jump. The new opus, said Tyrina. Lucius was dominating the fashion universe this week, and dominate was the right word. My editor was dressed in leather and iron, rusted spikes on her wrists and neck, and a massive bandolier across her shoulder and left breast. The cartridges looked real. Yeah, I said, and tossed the manuscript box on her desk. Martin, 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 she sighed. When are you going to transmit your books rather than going to all of the trouble of printing them out and bringing them here in person? There's a strange satisfaction in delivering them, I said, especially this one. Oh, yes, I said. Why don't you read some of it? Tyrina smiled and clicked black fingernails along the cartridges on her bandolier. I'm sure it's up to your usual high standards, Martin, she said. I, I don't have to look at it. Please do, I said. Really, said Tyrina, there's no reason. It always makes me nervous to read a new work while the author is present. This one won't, he said. Read just the first few pages. She must have heard something in my voice, because she frowned slightly and opened the box. The frown deepened as she read the first page and flipped through the rest of the manuscript. Page one had a single sentence. And then, one fine morning in October, the dying earth swallowed its own bowels, spasmed its final spasm, and died. The other 299 pages were blank. A joke, Martin? Nope. A subtle hint, then? You would like to begin a new series? Nope. It's not as if we hadn't expected it, Martin. Our storyliners have come up with several exciting series ideas for you. M. Sambuese thinks she would be perfect for the novelization of the Crimson Avenger Hollies. You can stick the Crimson Avengers up your corporate ass, Tyrena, I said cordially. I'm finished with Transline, and this premasticated gruel you call fiction. Tyrena's expression did not flicker. Her teeth were not pointed. Today they were rusted iron to match the spikes on her wrist and the collar around her neck. Martin, 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 she sighed. You have no idea how finished she will be if you don't apologize. Straighten up and fly right. But that can wait until tomorrow. Why don't you sleep? Why don't you step home? Sober up and think about this. I laughed. I'm as sober as I've been in eight years, lady. It just took me a while to realize that it wasn't just me who's writing crap. There's not a book published in the web this year that hasn't been total garbage. Well, I'm getting off the scow. Tyrena rose. For the first time, I noticed that on her simulated canvas web belt there hung a forced death wand. I hoped that it was a designer fake, as designer fake as the rest of her costume. Listen, you miserable no-talent hack. She hissed. Transline owes you, owns you from the balls up. If you give us any more trouble, we'll have you working on, in the gothic romance factory under the name Rosemary Titmouse. Now go home, sober up, and get to work on Dying Earth 10. I smiled and shook my head. Tyrena squinted slightly. You're still into us for almost a million mark advance, she said. One word to collections and we'll seize every room of your house except that goddamn raft you use as an outhouse. You can sit on it until the ocean fills up with crap. I laughed a final time. It's a self-contained disposal unit, I said. Beside, I sold the house yesterday. The check for the balance of the advance should have been transmitted by now. Tanrina tapped the plastic grip of her death wand. Translines copyrighted the Dying Earth concept, you know. We'll just have someone else write the books. I nodded. They're welcome to it. Something in my ex-editor's voice changed when she realized that I was serious. Somewhere, I sensed, there was an advantage to her if I stayed. Listen, she said. I'm sure we can work this out, Martin. I, I was saying to the director the other day that your advances were too small and that Transline should let you develop a new storyline. Tyrena, 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 I sighed. Goodbye. I forecast to Renaissance Vector and then to Perismoni, where I boarded a spinship for the three-week voyage to Asquith and the crowded kingdom of Sad King Billy. Notes for a sketch of Sad King Billy. His Royal Highness King William the Twenty Third, Sovereign Lord of the Kingdom of Windsor in Exile, looks a bit like a wax candle of a man who has been left on a hot stove. His long hair runs in limp rivulets to slumped shoulders, while the furrows of his brow trickle downward to the tributaries of wrinkles around the basset hound eyes, and then run southward again through folds and frown lines to the maze of waddles in neck and jowls. King Billy is said to remind anthropologists of the worry dolls of the outback Kinshasa, to make Zen gnastics recall the pitfall Buddha 
after the temple fire on Taizin, and to send media historians rushing to their archives to check photos of an ancient flat film movie actor named Charles Lofton. None of these references mean anything to me. I look at King Billy and think of my long-dead tutor Don Balthazar after a week-long binged. Sad King Billy's reputation for gloominess is exaggerated. He often laughs. It is merely his misfortune that his peculiar form of laughter makes most people think he is sobbing. Man cannot help his physiognomy, but in His Highness's case, the entire persona tends to suggest either buffoon or victim. He dresses, if that can be the word, in something approaching a constant stake state of anarchy, defying the taste and color sense of his android servants, so that on some days he clashes with himself and his environment simultaneously. Nor is his appearance limited to sart sartorial chaos. King William moves in a permanent sphere of disability. His fly unsealed, his vel velvet cape torn and tattered, drawing crumbs magnetically from the floor, his left she sleeve ruffled twice as long as his right, which, in turn, looks as if it had been dipped in jam. You get the idea. For all this, Sad King Billy has an insightful mind and a passion for the arts and literature which has not been equaled since the true Renaissance days on Old Earth. In some ways, King Billy is the fat child with his face eternally pressed to the candy store window. He loves and appreciates fine music, but cannot produce it. A connoisseur of ballet and all things graceful, His Highness is a klutz, a moving series of pratfalls and comic bits of clumsiness, a passionate reader, unerring poet, critic, and patron of forensics, King Billy combines a stutter in his verbal expression with a shyness which will not allow him to show his verse or prose to anyone else. A lifelong bachelor now entering his 60th year, King Billy inhabits the tumble-down palace and 2,000-square-mile kingdom as if it were another suit of rumpled royal clothes. Anecdotes abound. One of the famous oil painters whom King Billy supports finds His Majesty walking head down, hands clasped behind him, one foot on the garden path and one in the mud, obviously lost in thought. The artist hails his patron. Sad King Billy looks up, blinks, looks around as if awakening from a long nap. Excuse me, His Highness says to the amused painter, but, but, but can you p p please tell me, was I headed toward the palace or away from the p p palace? Toward the palace, your majesty, replies the artist. Oh, g g good, sighs the king. Then I've had lunch. General Horace Glennon Height had begun his rebellion, and the, out on, and the out were, outback world of Asquith lay directly in his path of conquest. As Asquith was not worried, the hegemony had offered a force space fleet as a shield, but the royal ruler of the kingdom of Monaco in exile seemed more melted than ever when he called me in. Martin, said his majesty, you've heard about the battle at for Formahalt. Yes, I said. It doesn't sound like anything to worry about. Formahalt was just the kind of place Glennon Heights been hitting. Small, no more than a few thousand colonists, rich in minerals and with a, t with a time demit of at least, what, what is it? Twenty standard months from the web? Twenty-three, said Sad King Billy. So you don't think that we are in jeopardy? Uh, uh-uh, I said. With only a three-week real transit time and a time debt of less than a year, the hegemony can always get forces here from the web faster than the general can spin up from Formahalt. Perhaps, mused King Billy, beginning to lean on a globe and then jumping upright as it started to turn under his weight. But nonetheless, I've decided to start our own modest tigra. I blinked. Surprised. Billy had been talking about relocating the kingdom in exile for almost two years, but I had never thought he would go through with it. The sp 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 the ships are ready on Pavardi, he said. A Asquith has agreed to s s s s to s provide tra the transport we need to the web. But the palace, I said, the library, the farms and grounds. Donated, of course, said King Billy, but the contents of the library will travel with us. I sat on the arm of the horsehair divan and rubbed my cheek. In the ten years since I had been in the kingdom, I had progressed from Billy's subject of patronage to tutor to confidant to friend, but never did I pretend to understand the disheveled enigma. Upon my arrival, he had granted me an immediate audience. D -d -d Do you wish to join the other talented people in our little colony? He had asked. Yes, your majesty, 
and will you write more books like the d d Dying Earth? Not if I can help it, Your Majesty. I r read it, you know, the little man said. It was v v very interesting. You're most kind, sir. B b bullshit and silentness. It was interesting because someone had obviously b b b bolerized it and left in all the bad parts. I had grinned, surprised by the sudden revelation that I was going to like, said King Billy. B -b -b but the cantos, he sighed, th that was a book. Probably the finest volume of b -b 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 poetry published in the web in the last two centuries. How you managed to get that by the mediocrity police, I will never know. I ordered 20,000 copies for the c kingdom. I bowed my head slightly, at a loss for words for the first time since my post-stroke days two decades before. Will you write more p p poetry like the cantos? I came here to try, your majesty. Then welcome, said sad King Billy. You will stay in the west wing of the p p castle, near my offices, and my door will always be open to you. Now I glanced at the closed door and at the little sovereign who, even when smiling, looked as if he were on the verge of tears. Hyperion, I asked. He had mentioned the colony world gone primitive many times. Precisely. The android seed ships have been there for some years, m m m Martin, preparing the way, as it were. I raised an eyebrow. King Billy's wealth came not from the assets of the kingdom, but from the major investments in the web e economy. Even so, if he had been carrying on a surreptitious recolonization effort for years, the cost must have been staggering. Do, do, do you remember why the originally, original colonists named the p p p p the world? Hyperion, Martin. Sure. Before the Hegra, they were a tiny freehold on one of the moons of Saturn. They couldn't last without terrestrial resupply, so they immigrated to the outback and named the survey world after their moon. King Billy smiled sadly. And do you know why the name is propitious pro pro for our endeavor? It took me about ten seconds to make the connection. Keats, I said. Several years earlier, near the end of a long discussion about the essence of poetry, excuse me, King Billy had asked me who was the purest poet who had ever lived. The purest, I said. Don't you mean the greatest? No, no, said Billy. That's absurd to, to argue over who is the greatest. I'm curious about your opinion of the p purest, the closest to the essence you describe. I had thought about it a few days and then brought my answer to King Billy as we watched the setting suns from the top of the bluff near the palace. Red and blue shadows stretched across the amber ta lawn toward us. Keats, I said. John Keats, whispered sad King Billy. Ah. And then a moment later, why? So I had told him what I knew about the 19th century old earth poet, about his upbringing, training, and early death, but mostly about a life dedicated almost totally to the mysteries and beauties of poetic creation. Billy had seemed interested then. He seemed obsessed now as he waved his hand and brought into existence a hollow model which all but filled the room. I moved backward, stepping through hills and buildings and grazing animals to get a better view. Behold, Hyperion, whispered my patron, as was usually the case when he was totally absorbed King Billy forgot to stutter. The hollow shifted through a series of views, river cities, port cities, mountain ires, a city on a hill filled with mo monuments to match the strange buildings in the nearby village. The time tombs, I said. Precisely, the greatest mystery in the known universe. I frowned at the hyperbole. They're fucking empty, I said. They've been empty since they were discovered. They are the source of a strange anti-entropic force field which lingers still, said King Billy, one of the few phenomena outside singularities which dares to tamper with time itself. It's no big deal, I said. It must have been like painting rust prevention on, a metal, met, on metal. They were made to last, but they're empty. And since when do we go bugfuck about technology? Not technology sighed King Billy, his face melting into deeper grooves. Mystery, the strangeness of place so necessary to some creative spirits, a perfect mixture of the classical utopia and the pagan mystery. I shrugged, not impressed. Sad King Billy waved the hollow away. Has your poetry improved? I crossed my arms and glared at the regal dwarf slob. No. Has your muse returned? 
I said nothing. If looks could have killed, we would all be crying. The king is dead. Long live the king before nightfall. Very well, he said, showing that he could look insufferably smug as well as sad. Pack your bags, my boy. We're going to Hyperion. Fade in. Sad King's Billy's five seed ships, floating like golden dandelions above a lapis sky. White cities rising on three continents, Keats and Dimion, Port Romance, the poet city itself. More than eight thousand of arts pilgrims seeking escape from the tyranny of mediocrity and searching for a renewal of vision on this rough-hewn world. Asquith and Windsor in Exile had been a center for android biofacturing in the century following the Hegra, and now those, these blue-skinned friends of man labored and tilled with the understanding that once these final labors were finished, they were free at last. The white cities rose. The indigenes, tired of playing native, came out of their villages and forests and helped us rebuild the colony to more human specifications. The technocrat and bureaucrats and escocrats were thawed and let loose upon the unsuspecting world, and sad King Billy's dream came one step closer to reality. By the time we arrived at Hyperion, General Horace Glennon Height was dead, his brief but brutal mutiny already crushed, but there was no turning back. Some of the more rugged artists and artisans spurned the poet's city and eked out rugged but creative lives in Jacktown or Port Romance, or even in the expanding frontiers beyond, but I stayed. I found no muse on a Hyperion doing, during those first years. For many, the expansion of distant, distance because of limited transportation, EMVs were unreliable, skimmers scarce, and the con contraction of artificial consciousness due to the absence of datasphere, no access to the all thing and the only, only one fat line transmitter, all led to a renewal of creative energies, a new realization of what it meant to be human and an artist. Or so I heard. No muse appeared. My verse continued to be technically proficient and dead as Huck Finn's cat. I decided to kill myself. But first I spent some time, nine years at least, carrying out a community service by providing the one thing new Hyperion lacked, decadence. From a biosculptor aptly named Grom and Hackett, I obtained the hairy flanks, hooves, and goat legs of a satyr. I cultivated my beard and extended my ears. Grauman made an interesting made interesting alterations to my sexual apparatus. Word got around. Peasant girls, indigenes, and wives of our true blue city planners and pioneers all awaited a visit from Hyperion's only resident satyr, or arranged one themselves. I learned what Priapic and satyrisis really mean. Besides the unending series of sex sexual contests, I allowed my drinking bouts to become legendary and my vocabulary to return to something approaching the old post-stroke days. It was fucking wonderful. It was fucking hell. And then, on the night I had set aside to blow my brains out, Grendel appeared. Notes for a sketch of our visiting monster. Our worst dreams have come alive. Something wicked shuns the light. Shades of Morbius and Krell. Keep the fires high, mother. Grendel comes tonight. At first, we think the missing are merely absent. There are no watchers on the walls of our city, no walls, actually, no warriors at the doors of our mead halls. Then a husband reports a wife who disappears between the evening meal and the tucking in of their two children. Then Hoban Christus, an abstract implosionist, fails to appear at midweek performance at Poet's Amphitheater, his first missing missed cue in 82 years of treading the boards. Concern rises. Sad King Billy returns from his labors as overseer on the Jacktown Restoration, and promises that security will be tightened. A censor net is woven around the town. Ship security officers sweep the time tombs and report that all remains empty. Mechs are sent into the labyrinth entrance at the base of the Jade Tomb and report nothing in a 6,000-kilometer probe. Skimmers, automated and manned, sweep the area between the city and the Brindle Range, and sense nothing larger than the heat signature of a rock eel. For a local week, there are no more disappearances. Then the deaths began. The sculptor Pete Garcia is found in his studio, and in his bedroom, and in the yard beyond. Ship security manager Truen Hines is foolish enough to tell a news sweep. It's like he was mauled by some vicious animal. 
but no animal I have ever seen could do that to a man. We are all secretly thrilled and titillated. True, the dialogue is bad, straight out of a million movies and hollies we've scared ourselves with, but now we're part of the show. Suspicion turns toward the obvious. A psychopath is loose among us, probably killing with a pulse blade or a hell whip. This time, he or she had not found time to dispose of the body. Poor Pete. Ship security manager Hines is sacked, and the city manager Pruitt receives permission from his majesty to hire, train, and arm a city police force of approximately 20 officers. There is talk of truth-testing the entire poet city population of 6,000. Sidewalk cafes buzz with conversations of civil rights. We were technically out of the hegemony. Did we have any rights? And harebrained schemes are hatched to catch the murderer. Then the slaughter begins. There was no pattern to the murders. Bodies were found in twos and threes, or alone, or not at all. Some of the disappearances were bloodless. Others left gallons of gore. There was no witnesses, no survivors of attacks. Location did not seem to matter. The Weinmott family lived in one of the outlying villas, but Syra Robb never stirred from her tower studio near the center of town. Two of the victims disappeared alone at night, apparently while walking in the Zen garden, but Chancellor Lindman's daughter had private bodyguards, yet vanished while alone in a bathroom on the seventh floor of the sad King Billy's palace. On Lucius or Tau City Center, or a dozen... A, a dozen other of the old web worlds, the death of a thousand people added up to minor news. Items for Datasphere, short term, or the inside pages of the morning paper. But in a city of 6,000, on a colony of 50,000, a dozen murders, like the proverbial sentence to be hanged in the morning, tends to focus one attention wonderfully well. I knew one of the first victims, Sisypris Harris had been one of my first conquests as a satyr, and one of my most enthusiastic. A beautiful girl, long, blonde hair, too soft to be real. A fresh-picked peach, complexion too virginal to dream of touching. A beauty too perfect to believe. Precisely the sort that even the most timid male dreams of violating. Sisypris now had been violated in earnest. They found only her head, lying upright in the center of Lord Byron's plaza, as if she had been buried to her neck in horrible marvel. I knew when I heard these details precisely what kind of creature we were dealing with, for a cat I had owned on Mother Estate had left similar offerings on the south patio most summer morning, the head of a mouse staring up from the sandstone in pure rodent amazement, or perhaps a ground squirrel's toothy grin, killing trophies from a proud but hungry predator. Sad King Billy came to visit me while I was working on my cantos. Good morning, Billy, I said. It's your majesty, grumped his majesty, in a rare show of royal pikeu. His stutter had disappeared the day the royal dropship landed on Hyperion. Good morning, Billy, your majesty. Hmm, <laughs> growled my liege lord, moving some papers and managing to sit in the only puddle of spilled coffee on an otherwise dry bench. You're riding again, Silenus. I saw no reason to acknowledge an acknowledgment of the obvious. Have you always used a pen? No, I said, only when I want to write something worth reading. Is that worth the reading? He gestured toward the small heap of manuscript I had accrued in two local weeks of work. Yes. Yes? Just yes? Yes. Will I get to read it soon? No. King Billy looked down and noticed that his left leg was in a puddle of coffee. He frowned, moved, and mopped at the shrinking pool with the hem of his cape. Never, he said. Not unless you outlive me. Which I plan to do, said the king while you expire from playing goat to the kingdom's ewes. Is that attempting a metaphor? Not in the least, said King Billy, merely an observation. I haven't forced my attention on a ewe since my boyhood days on the farm, I said. I promised my mother in song that I wouldn't indulge in sheep-fucking again without asking her permission. While King Billy looked on mournfully, I sang a few bars of an ancient ditty called There'll Never Be Another Ewe. Martin, he said, someone or something is killing my people. I set aside my paper and pen. I know, I said. I need your help? How, for Christ's sake? Am I supposed to track down the killer like some HTV detective? Have a fight to the fucking death on Reichenbach fucking falls? That would be satisfactory, Martin. But in the meantime, a few opinions and words of advice would suffice. Opinion one, I said. It was stupid to come here. Opinion two, it's stupid to say. Advice, Alpha, 
Omega, leave. Billy nodded dolefully. Leave this city or all of Hyperion? I shrugged. His Majesty rose and walked to the window of my small study. It looked out across a three-meter alley to the brick wall of the automated recycling plant next door. King Billy studied the view. You are aware, he said, of the ancient legend of the Shrine. I've heard bits of it. The indigenes associate the monster with the time tombs, he said. The indigenes smear paint on their bellies for the harvest celebration and smoke unrecombinant tobacco, I said. King Billy nodded at the wisdom of this. He said, the hegemony first down team was wary of this area. They set up the multi-channel record, record, recorders and kept their bases south of the brindle. Look, I said, your majesty, what do you want? Absolution for screwing up and building the city here? You're absolved. Go and sin no more, my son. Now, if you don't mind your royal ship, adios. I've got dirty limericks to write here. King Billy did not turn away from the window. You recommend that we evacuate the city, Martin. I hesitated for only a second. Sure. And would you leave with the rest? Why wouldn't I? King Billy turned and looked me in the eye. Would you? I said nothing. After a minute, I looked away. I thought so, said the ruler of the planet. He clasped his pudgy hands behind his back and stared at the wall again. If I were a detective, he said, I would be suspicious. The city's least productive citizen starts writing again after a decade of silence. Only what, Martin? Two days after the first murders happened? Now he's disappeared from the social life he once dominated and spends his time composing an epic poem. Shy, even the young girls are safe from his goatish, goatish ardor. I smiled. Goatish ardor, my lord. King Billy glanced over his shoulder at me. All right, I said, you've got me, I confess. I've been murdering them and bathing in their blood. It works as a fucking literary aphrodisiac. I figure two, three hundred more victims, tops, and I'll have my next book ready for publication. King Billy turned back to the window. What's the matter, I said, you don't believe me? No. Why not? Because, said the king, I know who the murderer is. We sat in the darkened hollow pit, watching the shrike kill novelist Syrah Robb and her lover. The light level was very low. Syrah's middle-aged flesh seemed to glow with a pale phosphorescence, while her much younger boyfriend's white buttocks gave the illusion in the dim light of floating separately from the rest of his tan body. Their lovemaking was reaching its frenzied peak when, an inexplicable, when the inexplicable occurred. Rather than the final thrusts and sudden pause of orgasm, the young man seemed to levitate up and backward, rising into the air as if Syrah had some, somehow forcefully ejected him from her body. The soundtrack on the disc previously consisting of the usual banal pants, grasps, exhortations, and instructions one would expect from such activity, suddenly fills the hollow pit with screams. First the young man's, then Cyrus. There was a thud as the boy's body struck a wall off camera. Cyrus' body lay waiting in tragically comic vulnerability, her legs wide, arms open, breasts flattened, thighs pale, her head had been thrown back in ecstasy, but now she had time to raise it, shock and anger already replacing the oddly similar expression of imminent orgasm. She opened her mouth to shout something. No words. There came the watermelon-carving sound of blades piercing flesh, of hooks being pulled free of tendon and bone. Sarah's body. Sarah's head went back. Her mouth opened impossibly wide. Her body exploded from the breastbone down. Flesh separated, as if an invisible axe were chopping Sarah Robb for kindling. Unseen scalpels completed the job of opening her. Lateral excisions ex appearing like obscene time-lapse footage of a mad surgeon's favorite operation. It was a brutal autopsy performed on a living person. On a once-living person, rather. For when the blood stopped flying flying and the body ceased spasming, Syrah's limbs relaxed in death, legs opening again in an echo of the obscene display of viscera above. And then, for the briefest second, there was a blur of red and chrome near the bed. Freeze, expand, and augment, King Billy told the house computer. The blur resolved itself into a head out of a jolt addict's nightmare, a face part steel, 
part chrome and part skull, teeth like a mechanized wolf's crossed with a steam shovel, eyes like ruby lasers burning through blood-filled gems, forehead penetrated by a curved spike blade rising thirty centimeters from a quicksilver skull, and a neck ringed with similar thorns. The shrike, I asked. King Billy nodded, the merest movement of chin and jowls. What happened to the boy? I asked. There was no sign of him when Cyrus' body was discovered, said the king. No one knew he was missing until this disc was discovered. He has been identified as a young recreation specialist from Endymion. You just found the hollow yesterday, said King Billy. The security people found the imager on the ceiling, less than a millimeter across. Syria had a library of such discs. The camera apparently was there only to record uh, the bedroom follies, I said. Precisely. I stood up and approached the floating image of the creature. My hand passed through forehead, spike, and jaws. The computer had calculated its size and represented it properly. Judging from the thing's head, our local Grendel stood more than three meters tall. Shrike, I muttered, more in greeting than in identification. What can you tell me about it, Martin? Why ask me, I snapped. I'm a poet, not a mytho-historian. Mytho you accessed the sheed ship computer with a query about the Shrike's nature and origins. I raised an eyebrow. Computer access was supposed to be as private and anonymous as data sphere entry in the hegemony. So what? I said. Hundreds of pe people must have checked out the Shrike legend since the killings began. Maybe thousands. It's the only fucking monster legend we've got. King Billy moved his wrinkles and folds up and down. Yes, he said. But you searched the files three months before the first disappearances. I sighed and slumped into the hollow pit cushions. All right, I said, I did. So what? I wanted to use the fucking legend in the fucking poem I'm writing, so I researched it. Arrest me. What did you learn? I was very angry now. I stamped satyr hooves into the soft carpet. Just the stuff in the fucking file, I snapped. What the hell do you want from me, Billy? The king rubbed his brow and winced as he accidentally stuck his little finger in his eye. I don't know, he said. The security people want to take you up to the ship and put you on a full in interrogative interface. I chose to talk to you instead. I blinked, feeling a strange zero-G sensation in my stomach. Full interrogative meant cortical shunts and sockets in the skull. Most people interrogated that way recovered fully. Most. Can you tell me what aspect of the Shrike legend you plan to use in your poem? King Billy asked softly. Sure, I said, according to the Shrike called gospel that the indigenous started the shrike is the lord of pain and the angel of final atonement come from a place beyond time to announce the end of the human race i liked the concept i liked the conceit the end of the human race repeated the king, king billy yes he's michael the archangel angel and moroni and satan and massed entropy and the frankenstein monster all rolled into one package he said he hangs around the time tombs, waiting to come out and wreak havoc when it's mankind's time to join the do dodo and the gorilla and the sperm whale on the extinction hit parade list. The Frankenstein monster, mused the short little fat man in the wrinkled cape. Why him? I took a breath. Because the Shrike cult believed that mankind somehow created the thing, I said, although I knew that King Billy knew everything I knew and more. Do they know how to kill it? he asked. Not that I know of. He's supposed to be immortal, beyond time. A god. I hesitated. Not really, I said at last. More like one of the universe's worst nightmares come to life. Sort of like the Grim Reaper, but with a per penchant for sticking souls onto a giant thorn tree, while the people's souls are still in their bodies. King Billy nodded. Look, I said, if you insist on splitting hairs from backworld theologies, why don't you fly to Jacktown and ask a few of the cult priests? Yes, said the king, chin on his pudgy fist, obviously distracted. They're already on the seed ship being interrogated. It's all most confusing. I rose to leave, not sure if I would be allowed to. Martin? Yeah? Before you go, can you think of anything else that could help us understand this thing? I paused in the doorway, feeling my heart batting at my ribs to get out. Yeah, I said, my voice only marginally steady. I can tell you who and what. The Shrike really is. Oh. It's my muse, I said, and turned, and went back to my room to write.
Well, I think we shall leave that there for now. Um, a little bit on the light side this time. I'm doing my best. I'm going to try to record a little bit consistently throughout the week, and hopefully that will let me get it out every Thursday or Friday. Um, I hope you have a good week. I hope you enjoyed. Next time we will finish The Poet's Tale. Um, I hope you have a good week. Goodbye.